College of Being Patient. We've made this a little longer than we expected. I hope you guys uh, can hang in there. Thank you. Uh, so I have never met Dr. Mark Roten. I've exchanged email with him a few times. Um, so he's going to tell us about the Tetra project, which I only recently added to my spreadsheet because it's not technically a ventilator. So I produced a new tab for the kind of device that uh, he's presenting. So take it away, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, let me share my screen here. And uh, can you guys see this? The whole thing? Or you just see the, do you see the PowerPoint spread or you see the whole screen thing? We, we see the PowerPoint. Ah, God damn it. Zoom. You're not doing me any, any favors here. So let's, uh, let's just share the whole screen then. Uh, play from the start. All right. So uh, I'm here representing Project Tetra. There's about 20 of us operating and we are working on four way ventilator splitting. And so uh, we've started working on this project way back in March when we uh, realized that uh, ventilator, ventilators are going to be short. Uh, we saw a lot of other good projects getting started. We saw you know, JPL doing their thing and we said, you know, we're not gonna compete with that. Uh, these guys are doing great work. Uh, let's let them do their great work. Uh, but let's try to address what we all thought was going to be an immediate need right now. Uh, we did see uh, splitting being used in uh, Mount Sinai. We saw splitting being used in Italy. Uh, we had clinical contacts in both places throughout the team. And so we saw that these were needs that uh, clinicians were having to go to hardware stores and buy hoses and attach their hoses to ventilators. And we said, we can do a better job than that. So what can we do to get clinicians what they need in order to be able to, uh, to, solve their, to, to solve their splitting problem. So our goal here uh, is we wanna be able to attach multiple patients to a single ventilator in the event of a ventilator shortage. We wanna be as safe as possible, and it's, but it's still only for emergency use. Like, and I wanna, I wanna emphasize that very, very clearly. Like, I don't expect somebody to be sitting on a vent splitter for multiple days. Like this is just, I have to make a clinical choice. I need to put, as, as one of our clinical advisors puts it, you need to put a pause button, right? You need to be able to say, okay, hold it. We've run out of these supplies. We need to put this person, we need to intubate this person. We've run out of ventilators. Let's intubate them and let's attach them via the splitter to, to another, you know, with another patient who's matched and then go from there, but not let's have a, you know, ward full of this, uh, a ward full of split people. Uh, we want the system to be as locally producible as possible. We're going with as many 3D printable parts as we can. Uh, we want it to be as open, as open source as possible. We want it to be able to pass an FDA EUA process when you have control of the manufacturing process. So a, a lot of vent splitter regulation, or rather a lot of the EUAs that have come out of the FDA for vent splitters have been focused around uh, both the, uh, the, the labeling, uh, the usage, as well as on the biocompatibility. And so we want to make sure that like, in order to ensure biocompatibility, we have to control the manufacturing process. Just, that's just how you get the plastics and so forth to be uh, uh, authorizable. And so um, we also, as has been pointed out, it could have non-COVID-19 use cases. But that would require a 510K at the least, and we're just not there. Um, in the interest of time, I'll skip this slide because in the next slide, I talk to each one of those points. So. What we wanted to come up with is the, the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, uh, came up with a list of reasons why you should never split vents ever, ever, ever. And so we took that as our initial design document, as a way of saying, okay, if these are the reasons you should never split vents, let's address all of those individual components and all of those individual risks, and then uh, go from there and say, okay, we are address, address, addressing all the risks, let's move from that point. So for instance, they said, Volumes going to the most compliant lung segments. So uh, what they're speaking about here, and they speak about it in a couple of different ways, is that if you have two patients and they're on the same ventilator, as one patient gets better and the other patient gets, just stays the same, the patient that gets better gets more compliant lungs. And as their lungs get more and more compliant, more air goes into them, and then you have a, a much higher chance of injury on the patient who is getting better because the lung is more compliant, more air goes and it ruptures. Meanwhile, the other patient doesn't get the air and then that other patient drowns. And so you end up with two deaths where you might have not had both patients dying. So that's the very first thing that we wanted to, uh, to address. So the first thing here is actually talking about 
how do you put two patients on the splitter at once? So there has to be a protocol for putting patients on splitters, and then you have to be able to adjust for each patient as those patients get better or worse. Second point, PEEP is not manageable. We've actually managed to solve this uh, when the circuit is properly closed, the use of a bias circuit that allows the ventilator to maintain PEEP throughout the entire ventilator system. So this is something that we've tested and shown repeatedly that we can do this. Alarm monitoring is not feasible. Well, there's two answers to this. First of all, uh, these patients are gonna be monitored uh, constantly. All of the clinical advisors that we've talked to uh, in Nigeria and Lagos, in Los Angeles, like they've all, in Brazil, they've all spoken to the fact that there's going to be constant monitoring anyway, and the ventilators will still be able to provide alarming. So we are not overriding any of the alarming functions on the ventilators. Uh, what will happen is that if any individual patient has a problem, then we would require that those, you know, medical practitioners nearby notice and deal with it. Individual management, impossible. Again, we will allow for per patient volume adjustment in order to be able to address that. Cardiac arrest requires stopping care for all patients. Okay, so then our design constraint is we need to be able to detach and reattach patients easily and quickly in order to be able to handle cardiac arrest. Added circuit volume defeats the self-test. Again, we involve added a bias circuit, and now the ventilators can start without uh, failing their self-tests. External monitoring required. So we'll have to provide external monitoring. We do that. Patients, we have both a pressure and volume sensor, uh, pressure and uh, flow sensors in the system. Patients deteriorating at different rates. Again, we're gonna allow per patient volume adjustment in order to be able to allow each individual isolated patient, isolated by check valves, in order to make sure that those patients can be uh, adjusted separately. Sudden patient deterioration really affects other patients. Again, now we're gonna allow for straightforward uh, patient attachment or detachment. Then we have the ethics of risking more patients. So. What we believe is that if we've addressed these previous nine concerns, then we are addressing the 10th. Like the 10th is basically saying, you know, if you have a problem with one person riding a bus, you have a problem with two people riding a bus. If you have a problem with four people riding a bus, you have a problem with five people riding a bus. So we believe that by addressing the first nine, we have addressed that ethical concern. But of course, it's going to be up to the, you know, adopting physician for whether or not they believe the ethical concerns have been mitigated. That's really on the doctor. That's not necessarily on the ASA. Uh, so then if we go to the next slide, here's some more risks that the ASA did not talk about. First of all, these things can't fall over, literally. They can't be knocked over because if you have four patients attached to an individual splitter and it gets knocked over, then you have four patients who suddenly need to get dealt with, not just one. Uh, but this also speaks to a larger problem. And this, like, when we were first doing clinical testing, uh, Dr. Valerie Sebo was with me and we were at the VA in, in Los Angeles. And she turned to me very casually after we had you know, done, another, done another test and she said, you know, we've killed this patient 50 times now. And so what we did was we said, wait a second, we have to make sure that we have really good attachment and detachment protocols. And then we have really good latching onto where it needs to be mounting systems so that these types of failures just simply don't happen. Uh, we have to have power for monitoring systems to handle 20 minutes of a power outage. We have to have it be buildable in the field or has to pass FDA EU approval. EUA approval. The FDA has stated they will not allow 3D printed parts as part of their approval process. You have to use injection molding. You have to use, uh, you have to use approved FDA uh, manufacturing capabilities in order to do that. But if you're in Nigeria, you might not have access to that. If you're in Brazil, if you're in Chile, if you're in some of these third world nations, you might not have access to that. So we want to make it as buildable as possible using approved materials in order to be able to get it there. Uh, the knobs can't be, you know, it has to, the system has to operate under pressure for quite a long time. It can't leak aerosolized virus into the room. Your PEEP valves, PEEP valves traditionally on these types of emergency systems will leak to the room. This is an entirely self-contained system. There is no PEEP that leaks into the room. That's really critically important because we don't want to have any viral load in the air if possible. And we can't cross-contaminate patients either because, but because of viral load concerns, because you might have different strains, et cetera. Here are some 3D renders of the device. Uh, without speaking too quickly, because I know that there is a, a time constraint here, um, basically what happens is that these are each of the patient attachment points here. Okay, I'm getting the time signal. You've got, this is a flow control knob. These are shutoff knobs. So basically you have to attach or detach a patient. You slam the shutoff knobs. You detach the patient, do what you need to do. Attach a patient, open the shutoff valves. This big knob allows for flow control. 
by allowing different amounts of flow to go to individual patients. And you have a screen here to see individual flow and pressure sensors for each patient. And we're actually actively building this right now where our target is on Saturday to build our first prototype. This is the aluminum casing that we've, uh, that uh, one of our team members managed to put together and ship out yesterday. And these are some parts that I'm printing right now. That is it. Hopefully that was fast enough. Any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Mark. I'll I'll start again. You, so you mentioned your clinical partner, yeah. so the actual potential end users. So I believe they are themselves members of the ASA. Um, uh, she has, she has uh, said under multiple times that she wishes to have more conversations with a bunch of other people. Yeah. So I'm not going to repeat her words. They were not, they were not uh, repeatable. Let's put it that way. So, um, my question was, to what extent have you tried to involve the ASA into the project uh, to give you back some inputs and reviews? And I mean, she was our best contact point into them, mm -hmm. and they weren't responding to her. Uh, so okay. at this point, we weren't, I mean, I don't know why they would respond to me versus responding to her. So. And we just decided, I decided to focus more on getting something done than, than waiting. Eric? Eric? Yeah. Hi, Mark. We've, we've chatted a fair bit over Slack on this and with some of your team as well. I mean, the thing that really impresses me is how robust a lot of your engineering is and how diligently you've tried to um, overcome the ASA concerns. I mean, you know my position on this. Um, and I, I guess I'm, I'm still, I mean, I continue to be really impressed by the work that you've done um and i uh, and i just you know and i um i i think yeah i mean i i think the the design isn't yeah isn't the way i'd go but I, what i'm really hopeful for um going forward is that um all the learning that you've done and a lot of the problem solving that you've done about the monitoring and about the valves um and just the general awareness that your team now has about what it's like to operate in this environment with the infection risk and all, all, all the rest of it, that that knowledge can be taken forward and, and applied to, to other, other projects. So, um, yeah, I mean, hats off, hats off to the, you know, to all the problem solving you've done. I mean, it's really, yeah, it's, it's really extraordinary. And I'm sort of, um, yeah, it's, it's because, it's because you've done such a good job of it that my concerns become so, um, you know, so, so, so heightened, really, because I think if we could apply that kind of problem solving to a to the to an individualized ventilator, I'm you know, I'd really like to see that happen because I think that could be, um, yeah, that could really deliver a lot of a lot of benefit. Um, and I think just on the just on being able to tailor the therapy to the patient. I mean, the, the therapy has a lot to do with not just the pressures and volumes delivered, although that's important, but also the oxygen concentration and also the timing. And yeah, and, and unfortunately these are, the, the timing matter particularly is, in, is intractable with the, the splitting design. So, I mean, I think, you know, it's unfortunately, you know, that's, that's not gonna be solvable, um, yeah, unless you've made four individual ventilators in a, in a box. Yeah, no, um, and we know that, and that's why we're saying this is a pause button. Like, and a lot of our, a lot of our clinical, like, as Valerie pointed out to me, you know, and and I think that we saw this you know, recently with a doctor committing suicide in New York. What happens is the clinicians, at least in the United States, and I can't speak for other nations, they're not trained to be able to say, okay, we've run out of stuff, go to the corner and die. And so there, there's, there's two things that this, that this device attempts to alleviate sort of in a, broader, in a broader sense. The first is to be able to say, look, we really want this patient to have a chance. We want to put a pause button. We know that they have comorbidities that look like this other patient, so we can do a matching protocol. We can put them on the vent together, and then we can, in the meantime, try to scavenge other pieces of equipment to, to get them off the split vent. Right, so that's, that's the first thing. But the second thing is really taking care of our clinical care providers, 
right? Because a lot of these people who are on the front lines, they are completely exhausted. And they're already going to be running 24-hour shifts to be monitoring patients who are on ventilators, right? It is, it is going to be really bad for the front lines. And I think we all, if we all are acknowledging that, like we really, we do all really need to understand that. And that what we want to do is we want to be able to give these people who are exhausted, who are doing their level best to keep people alive, as many options as possible when they're in that situation, right? So I mean, that, that's really the sort of the secondary medical. Dr. Nolte? Yeah, I, I think I remember talking with you after the last um, the VentCon meeting, and um, I guess it's just more of a, a comment in general, and then maybe like a slight question about your, your timeline for when you think you'll get to a point where you have something that you're willing to like ship or go somewhere with, because I've heard a lot about the stories in New York and how people like the co-venting protocols, and as someone who studied pulmonary biomechanics, I was absolutely horrified that they would put you know, um, multiple people on the same ventilator for all of the reasons that you discussed. And I think if there was a way to do it where you can alleviate the risk of that as much as possible and identify if something is changing with someone, you, you've you done a great job. So, um, so I'm excited to see where your device goes because I do think that there are situations where I can't believe I ever thought I would say, I thought co-venting people would be something that I think could work. But um, for at least from a pulmonary biomechanics standpoint, and I'm not a clinician, um, but I, I definitely think you have something that if people were determined to do it, you could provide them, I think, the best way to do it. Right. Thank you. And to, to answer your question, our goal, we set a goal for ourselves for this weekend to be producing uh, our first alpha, I guess you could call it. We, we already have, I have a device sitting on the, on the table behind me that is held together with hope and duct tape and we won't want to ship that uh and so like this is going to be the one where it's you know fully sla resins you know everything is put into the case that i showed earlier uh we're going to have a raspberry pi with the display like all of those all of those components that's the goal is to have that together this weekend will we make it uh, maybe we'll talk next weekend maybe next weekend is the goal but that's the goal for the alpha and then we do lots and lots of testing lots and lots of testing here, are we ready to move on? Yes, uh, I think, again, for a matter of fairness to the teams, let's move on. Okay, thank you. I am sorry to Smith Vent, which is going last. Uh, I'm terribly 